So today we're talking about charcoal and we're talking about still life and figures in particular. And of course, as I put these classes together, I realized there's about, oh gosh, I don't know, a few hundred things that I'd like to tell you all in the space of an hour. So that can be, you know, that'll be a little bit challenging to see, uh, to see how we go forward. Um, so, but I would like to just dive in and give you a bunch of information about charcoal, about various different um, ways to draw with charcoal. And we'll also, we're gonna, we'll do some simple exercises today uh, on still life and, and figures. And then next week I'm uh, doing a demonstration of something a lot more involved. Um, and then of course the, uh, the exercises and the, the work we do next week will also be more involved. So today I just want to get a lot of um, information about uh, technique, um, how to approach a drawing, and also sort of the next level of drawing, which is moving from line into, into talking about masses. So charcoal basically is a carbon residue, a very similar to graphite, but because it's uh, produced by strongly heating wood um, and it has a different um, sort of uh, a construction, a molecular construction, it's much looser, much darker. Uh, and it, um, it, makes, it, it makes some beautiful darks, but it also makes a lot of mess. So that's why I sort of recommend to people to start with a pencil form of charcoal if you possibly can. Um, it's just that much easier to handle. So here at the, uh, at the side on the right, you can see um, you know, vine charcoal, which are the long skinny uh, sticks. You can see blocks of charcoal, bricks of charcoal. Um, and then at the bottom, some of the, of the marks those make. Now, uh, just like the compressed graphite sticks, pigment can get added to charcoal to give it a color. So uh, we're moving from, from line to shading. And I had a couple of people reach out to me this last week saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the idea of drawing what I'm looking at, but I can't seem to get the depth I'm after. And that's where shading comes in. Um, we start to have this situation where, uh, and I'm using MC Escher as an example. This is actually a lithograph, but um, as a drawing, it definitely shows uh, what I'm talking about. When you draw with line, you're putting down a great deal of information um, with those lines. But in nature, we really don't have that many lines existing. If we look at the back of our hands, for example, um, and we try to draw that without any shading, of course, we're going to we're going to use some lines to represent what is going on at the back of our hands. But in in real life, we need something more subtle than that. And that's where whether with pencil or with charcoal, uh, doing some shading and, and using those values from the lightest values to the darkest values really help uh, give that depth and that illusion of reality. So you can mix drawing media together. And when we, although we're talking a lot about charcoal this week, anyone who's working just in pencil can really achieve the same effects, in particular if you have uh, some softer or very dark pencils. You'll notice that charcoal can get even darker than that, but still you can use the same range. Likewise, charcoal, um, you don't have to only use it for blending and, and subtlety. You can uh, make the same types of marks or outlines or whatever you'd like to do with charcoal that you do with pencil. So everything is, uh, uh, can be interwoven. One word I'll be using a lot is talking about mass. So when I say the dark masses in something, if we're looking at this M.C. Escher picture, for example, those shadow areas that are very dark under, under the hand and behind the fingers, I would call that like a dark mass. Uh, or if someone says massing in the darks, they're talking about um, using a dark pencil or, or dark charcoal to put in the large dark areas and not showing necessarily a lot of um, of, of value changes within that dark, dark area initially. I just mentioned that because that's a piece of terminology you might hear me mention as we go along. So what, what I was doing um, yesterday was just a bunch of different sketches with charcoal on, on different types of paper, just to show you sort of what can happen. And I do a lot of work on toned paper. Now this is not um, really toned paper that you buy at an art su supply store. This is a paper bag I cut up into various different pieces. And I, I like to try, uh, you know, everything from cardboard boxes to, um, you know, pieces of paper like this, newsprint, whatever I happen to have, just to see what happens. Because, for example, a paper bag has a, has a much more smooth 
surface than a lot of the toned paper I buy from an art supply place does. And so I was just making up little things, uh, you know, drawing my um, uh, coffee cup. And I tend to use a mixture of line and shading together. So although we'll be talking a lot about the subtlety of shading today, always feel that you can do whatever appeals to you. I like, I like putting a lot of texture in, even if the object I'm drawing doesn't have texture. So once again, there, there are no rules. <laughs> now here I did take a piece of this is called Canson paper. And in that materials list I sent around earlier, it's a type of paper I like using a lot. I like to work on toned paper because it does half the work for me. Instead of me having to create middle values um, of a pale gray, the, the color of the paper sort of does that. And all I really have to work, worry about are the very darks and the very lights. Um, so this is an example of just a few minutes of sketching something completely out of my head. Um, and I like to use the white charcoal and the black charcoal uh, to get those highlights in the darks, and then the paper becomes sort of the middle color. So if you have an opportunity, if you have um, either a white charcoal pencil or a white colored pencil or, or even chalk or even uh, white paint, um, to mess around with putting some white highlights if you have uh, some newsprint or colored paper around or, or, or paper bag, <laughs> um, and just seeing what you can do with this effect. Uh, once again, I'll, I'll be talking more about this as we go on in the summer, but I just wanted to throw this out there right now. Now, this is a kind of, of mixed media type of drawing that I do a lot, where I'll start it in pencil, but when I get to the darker stuff, I want to add a bit of charcoal in there for the darker parts. And the reason I'm showing this to you today is because this is a drawing that relies very heavily not so much on line, although there is some line in there, and obviously I use some lines to get the, the whole drawing started, but this relies very much on a light edge being uh, delineated by the dark shape around it or the darker value around it. So this was a complicated drawing to do because every, every place I wanted something light, I had to sort of work the dark shading up to the edge of that light area. And this is, this is sort of the exercise that we go through when we start moving from line to shading, is, re is reminding ourselves that unless we really need to show a little bit of line just to make it easier to understand what's going on, that really everything around us is just, a, is just shading of one sort or another on different textures and on different colors. So... Every surface displays a range of values. Even if you think you've got a flat piece of paper um, lying on your table, if you look at it carefully, depending on where the light from the window is shining or the light overhead, there is going to be a subtle difference to, uh, from one side of the page to another of, of the light and the dark. Sometimes it's not easy to see, especially if the paper is small. But if you start looking for this, start looking for these surface variations, this is what starts to lend a great deal, deal of realism to your work. And these are called value changes. So you can see it pretty easily uh, in the book at the top, um, because of course the light is shining in from the right and the everything that's curved over to the <coughs> left is looking darker. Um, and likewise in the box, if you squint at that box, you can see how the top of the box is light over on the right side and gets darker as you head to the left. And likewise, the table and, everything, and, and the sides of the box also have their own gradations. So starting to be much more aware of, of value changes is, is the first step when it comes to shading, to understanding how to make something look kind of 3D. Otherwise, what happens is we just start shading away. <laughs> you know, we're like, oh, I gotta put some color, I've got to do some stuff in here, and I'm gonna blend and I'm going to, you know, add some darks over here. And what you end up with is something that it doesn't seem to work in real life because we're not paying attention to where the light's coming from and how even flat surfaces have these um, gradations. So what happens in our brain? is that we understand, um, uh, you know, we see, we see things every day. Our brain is giving us information. Um, it's telling us, yes, light is hitting a surface. You know, it's more, there are, there's more light over here, less light over here. But we're not necessarily always interpreting that information as an artist would. Um, likewise, if we do have just a small piece of paper, and it is hard to see the value change from, from one side of the page to another, we can, we can, concentrate on what we know. We know, of course, that the light is um, going to be 
the, the uh, surface is going to be brighter closer to the light source and darker further away. And we can use that information and exaggerate a little bit if we need to, to show something of interest and also to show how uh, various objects move through space and have sort of a, a sense of distance to them. Once again, I'm, I'm going to be throwing a lot of information at you this week, and then we'll be applying it later in the class and also more next class. But I just want to get these concepts out here. So here we have um, another little quick sketch I did. And this is, once again, just a box that I took out of my imagination. But I, I was showing how the light is coming from the left and how it would hit various different parts of the box in a way that casts shadows. So when an object, such as the flap of a box, um, basically blocks the light from hitting something else, it creates what is called a cast shadow. Now, if you have a, a box that is closed up and no open flaps, and you've got light shining from one side of the box, um, and it makes one edge of the box lighter and the other edge of the box darker, those are just the shadows created by the light hitting the object. But a cast shadow are these ones that are created by the flap. Likewise, here uh, we've got the box sitting on the ground, and that's called a cast shadow because the light is hitting the box and casting a shadow over the ground. This terminology is not, um, it's not super important to know, but it does. I, I wanted to explain what cast shadow means. It just means a shadow is being cast on another object. The, the uh, light is being blocked by something, which is different from just an object being lit and some part of that object is in the light and some part of that object is not in the light. And this is also an example of charcoal on a pretty rough paper. This is a watercolor paper I had around. And so what I did was I, I did a few quick outlines, which you can see here just to you know get the angles right. Um, and then I put down uh, some dark charcoal where the shadows were and I blended it in a little bit with my finger. I used an eraser to uh, make the, the lines a little, the, the edges of the shadows a little more defined. And then I added a little bit more dark. What will happen as you work with charcoal, which is different from working with pencil, is that every time you blend, so you'll put a nice dark down and you'll really like it, and you'll start blending a little bit, and all of a sudden the value will lighten because you've dispersed those little tiny bits of the, of the charcoal, um, and they are no longer clumped together in dark groups. So you will find that as you go along, your charcoal drawing will start to become, it'll be full of middle tones. Not that you'll have, you'll have smeared your charcoal over your light part <laughs> and you will, have, you will have lessened the value of your darks. So charcoal more than pencil, you have to keep going in and, and erasing out of your lights where you want to keep it bright and you'll have to go back in sort of restating the darks. So what I tend to do is, is keep that going during the course of the drawing. And at the very end, I do one more pass where I, where I clean up all the bits that I smeared around, or most of them anyway. Looking at this, I can see I left a few. And then I will also go back and restate the darks, but without, um, without smudging them in, keeping those darkest areas really dark. So... Um, someone asked me about leaves, <laughs> and I know this is not still life for figures, but I thought this was really interesting. So this is a really, leaves are a great example of how um, light hits an object, and depending on whether the uh, leaf is curved in such a way that it blocks the light, or whether the, the, um, the leaf is pointing towards you and has other leaves sort of blocking some of the, of the shadow, um, or whether there's a curve and light is hitting in certain ways. The shading is what makes uh, leaves realistic. And so shading and, and line work together to help create this illusion on the paper using darks and lights and, and tones. But it comes a lot just from observation. Each one of these leaves is a different form, um, a different amount of uh, reflectivity because whether they're glossy or not, uh, you know, how they're shaped, are they convex, are they concave, are other um, leaves on top of them casting shadows on the ones below. So careful observation of this definitely helps you make more realistic, uh, you know, anything, but definitely plants. When we get later into the summer into uh, doing the more of the botanical work, we'll, we'll address this a bit more. But I thought this was um, good to demonstrate that, that these, um, this information really applies across the board to anything you're trying to draw.
So I've got here just a quick example I had done um, ages ago of, of some leaves and the cast shadow that, that are cre um, was created. This is on toned paper and I've used a combination of pencil and then I used some charcoal that I smudged in for those, um, those shadows. And here's an example of, of using the line and the shading together. So if you're a person who likes to use line and you feel much more comfortable with it than just shading, feel free to sort of bridge that gap. And then on the right, I was just messing about and I, I drew this, this little doorway heading inside. And I said, you know what? This would make a really good exercise. So we are going to, as a warm up exercise, we are going to do a charcoal sketch or if you're working with pencils, a pencil sketch of a doorway. <laughs> so what I would like you to do just for a few minutes, we've got a little, um, just about five minutes or so to work on this. What I'd like you to do is start off by um, using some lines uh, just to, to, on your page, you don't have to worry about a no tan or anything of that nature. What you're going to want to do is just get some lines down that indicate the basic shape of this doorway and the fact that the doorway is, is open to the inside. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be um, sketching this in charcoal or using your darks to really get that feeling of a strong interior. So I just have some examples here of just, you know, just a few lines, just enough for you to know generally what's going on. And I'm going to show you um, sort of what the next step would be. So this is the next step. This is, so after you get those basic lines down, um, what you're looking for is you're looking to, uh, to get that sense, sense of depth. And this is where charcoal is really fun because you can, you can get these mysterious darks with them. And, this is a, just an interesting door in Montenegro. <laughs> I'm going to let you sketch on this for just a couple of minutes. I'll, I'm going to check and see what people have said in, in chat. Um, we'll, like I said, we won't get but so far, so you can uh, work on this later. But the most important thing is trying to get that angle of the bottom of the door so that it looks as if the door is opening to the interior. So do hold up your pencil if you need to. Check the angle of that door on the screen and then holding your hand steady, check what you've drawn on your artwork and see if they're in the same ballpark. Oh, somebody's asked an excellent question, which is, um, uh, is there a technique for sharpening charcoal pencils? I have to tell you that one of the reasons that I um, I'm often using both graphite and charcoal is because sometimes charcoal drives me bonkers. <laughs> and I'll just put it right out there. Um, and because, because of things like trying to sharpen it, as you get to the softer charcoal, as much fun as it is to use, it's also really easy if you're using a charcoal pencil um, to, to break the lead. Um, I tend to use a pen knife um, very, very carefully. And what I do, uh, if, you, if you hold if, if any of you have ever, ever done any grafting of, of trees or anything like that, you'll know that the technique is to hold your knife still and pull the pencil back, pull your elbow back. And the same technique works really well for uh, sharpening pencils and sharpening charcoal pencils. Basically, what you're doing is if, if you were to if you were to do that sort of whittling motion of, of moving the knife, you have a, a tendency to, it'll, it'll just keep breaking off more and more of that charcoal. It'll drive you crazy. But if you do it the other way around and just try to slice off the wood um, as, you, as you are doing the sharpening, you'll get, you'll get to a much better point. And then if you want to make it sharper than that, you can use a piece of, of fine sandpaper to get to a fine point. So what has happened over time is that I now use, I'll, I'll start my drawing off with some pencils just to get the basics down. I'll then move from there into the uh, kind of the middle um, charcoal pencils, which to me are like the HB, the 2B and the 4B. And then by the time I want to use a 6B, the really dark, I will use some of the vine charcoal or compressed charcoal or a very, very carefully sharpened uh, 6B charcoal pencil um, to get those darks. Because, uh, you know, it, it's one of these situations where sometimes the materials can really, you know, be a little frustrating. Um, but you get these, you get these wonderful depths. So that's sort of the reason to, to bother to try that. Just for um, the sake of the, uh, 
for educating ourselves. Um, I, I did try to put my 6B charcoal pencils into my electric pencil sharpener the other day and ended up with a real mess. It just broke off inside and gummed up the works. So I suggest not doing that. Um, I also tried doing using a metal pencil sharpener, but perhaps I'm just not very careful and torqued um, the pencil a little bit um, too much because uh, I found that the 6B broke off in that. So I can sharpen the 2B, the 4B, the HB, and all of those charcoal pencils just fine and uh, with my handheld pencil sharpener. But for anything softer, I go to a pen knife. I hope that helps. And if you're working with only pencils, that is perfectly fine. You know, I stated at the beginning of the of the uh, of the class that you could do the whole summer doing just pencils. And so, I want to introduce you to all of these various different um, medium, uh, so that you can try you know try various different methods. But at the same time. You can do exactly the same thing in pencil just by either uh, pressing a little bit harder, using a bit more pressure, using more cross hatching. Perhaps even in your pencils around home, I found this um, to be the case myself. Some of your pencils actually have a darker lead and then some have a, have a harder lead in. So just you know, get the range that you can out of this. And now that you're warmed up, we will move on to the next exercise. Oops. Okay, so lost edges. This is a huge deal. And you'll hear me talk about this all summer long. Lost edges are a way or just a, a really fun kind of a trick almost. Lost edges are are something that uh, artists start to see all over the place once you know about them. And they are the key to making your scenes look realistic and really interesting. So when an object is standing in deep shadow, uh, you know, or a dark object against a dark background or a light object against a light, object, uh, light background, what happens is the eye can't distinguish where the edges are. Our problem is that our, that our brain knows very well where the edges are. And it is chattering away in our ear going, you know, the, uh, the left hand, the right hand side of that cup is exactly the same as the left hand side of the cup. And, and that saucer doesn't actually have a big black hole in it. Actually, it has an edge. So we have a tendency as artists, if we start listening to that information that's being fed in, what happens is we draw lines where we don't actually see them. So a couple of things have to happen. One is that we have to really take the time to observe and sort of override our brain and actually not necessarily operate from um, a point of, of just you know flying blind and saying, I'm just going to draw only what I see. Obviously, that information is useful. But we have to get to the point where we understand what we're looking at, at the same time recognize that we can create an interesting three-dimensional illusion by allowing edges to get lost. So this is something that is done in painting, and it is done in photography, uh, and it is also done in, in drawing. And I've got some examples here to show you. So here's a beautiful example. And I'm sure you've probably seen uh, classical paintings that are done similarly, where, where things fade into the shadow to the point you hardly know what the object is, but your, your imagination fills in the rest of the information. It is really difficult when you start drawing not to want to put in what you think is the edge and, and the bottom and the, the bottom of the spout. It takes a little bit of restraint. But if we look for the, these lost edges, these places where the eye doesn't really distinguish what it sees, there are all sorts of opportunities to, to sort of unify what unify the scene through these lost edges and create a very realistic sense. So this is just a, a photo of some, I think they're pill bottles or something like that. But there are numerous places where you can't really, I mean, yes, you can, and you know, your brain knows that there's a bottom of that bottle that's lying over on, on the right. And you, you know that these are separate objects. But when you look at this as a grouping, it's unified by these areas where you really can't tell the value of the side of the lying down bottle from the one that's behind it. Likewise, those two lids, the one is sitting in the other. Now, our brains know those are two separate lids, but the realism is created by not having the differentiation uh, and also the, the shadow just sort of fades in as well. 
So the same thing happens on, on a white background. Um, if we squint at this, so if we look at this with our eyes open, our brains are, are making our eyes look very carefully and finding those edges. You know, we're almost like determined we're going to find those edges. But if we squint, we get a more artistic view and a more subtle view of, of this cup on the white background. So if we squint, we really only see these grayish shapes and, and the white area. And if we were to draw this very carefully, you know, squinting frequently so we didn't start putting too much information in, we would be able to create the illusion of a three-dimensional cup with using only these very subtle values and using no lines at all. Because you could use the, the background is a very subtle um, gray. It comes up to the edge of the whiter area. The interior of the saucer is a slightly darker gray. This require, requires a great deal of control. And it would be difficult to do a white cup in a white background in charcoal. I would definitely tend to, to pencil for something like that for the control. But the idea is that we know there are edges to objects when we look at them. Um, and we are used to approaching everything in an outline form. That's the informative data absorption mode. You know, this is what a, a, a cup looks like. This is what a saucer looks like. And of course, I've been telling you to imagine how that saucer continues around behind the cup, the part that we can, can't see, so that we make sure those ovals are correct. Um, as perspective goes down, the, the oval of the top of the cup is going to be a flatter oval than the oval of the uh, saucer because it is going down in space below our, our, our um, eyes. So we have all of that data coming in on one hand. Then we have what we actually see. When we squint, we don't see those lines. We don't see any lines, actually. We just see masses, gray masses all over the place. So getting to a realistic drawing and a really interesting drawing is a matter of melding those two. It's a matter of training our brain to be helpful and say, OK, yeah, I know about that information, but where can I do something interesting by losing edges and creating this sense that this object has a, has a form that disappears into space? And this is what I call the, the understanding. We draw with understanding, taking both what we see and what we know into account. So here we have another um, example. And once again, if you squint at this, you can see how there are a lot of lost edges at this point. You know, if you were to just draw the darker shapes, you would be able to get a very interesting sense of what was going on. And people would understand that it was a cup inside a bowl and plates and this, that, and the other, without having to draw everything as lines, lines all over the place. So this takes a while to get used to. Uh, and to begin with, of course, if you don't have a dark background, then you're left not knowing exactly what to do with the background you see here. Do you start drawing in lots of shading and this, that, and the other? Which is why we're going to start with dark backgrounds. Uh, in the meantime, though, I just want to point out another way that lost edges are useful. So this is a, a photograph, obviously, but the same thing works in photography as, um, as it does in painting. And that is where you put the most detail and where everything is the most clear uh, tends to be where the human eye um, goes to uh, first. Not only do we look at where the detail is, we also look at where the highest areas of contrast are. So our eye is kind of moving back and forth between the cup and those two cookies. One is in detail, the other is the dark area. And the photographer has made the background sort of, uh, you know, fade away. Everything is a lot um, more subtle. And there are edges lost all over the place where the jug um, uh, melds into that tablecloth. And also interesting places where like the milk that's inside that cup um, fades into the white of the of the, uh, the interior of the cup, um, where the shadows of the one cookie sort of fade into the other. These are small areas, but there are ways to create that sort of sense of realism. For example, you wouldn't want to just put a dark line around the, uh, the area where the milk is. You would want to show that through shading, that there are, there, there are changes to what we're looking at in subtle values, and there are lots of lost edges. So, um, what I'd like you to do is with this uh, little still life here is to do a quick notan and do a small sketch um, concentrating on the, the lost edges uh, that, you, that you see here because there are quite a number of them. This is just a still life I set up um, at the Chappie Art Workshop I did a, a few uh, winters ago here on Chappaquiddick Island where I just brought in a bunch of objects and some fabric and set them up. So 
I did a quick no tan over here on the right. You can see how I sort of approached it. Um, I would start with a quick no tan just to get your bearings, because one of the things you'll want to do is decide, do you want to have that red cloth back there or is that a distraction? And I decided to take it out and just keep um, a dark area behind that handle um, just to keep life simple for myself. Now, um, this this object, you can, of course, you can you understand what it is. You know, you know what it is. The, uh, there's a spout, there's a handle, you know, there's an open top. You know that the bottom is probably wider. Um, and likewise, you know, you've seen shells before, you understand about the, the swirls of the shell. But what I'm particularly interested in, whether you're working in charcoal and, or pencil, is get this note hand um, done. So you so you have spent a few minutes just looking at the light and dark. Then go ahead and do a quick uh, pencil sketch of just or, or uh, just light charcoal, whichever you um, have, just indicating as we did with the door, uh, you know, where those where some of the lines are on this object. And then using a medium soft charcoal or regular pencil, start to sketch in the dark areas. Like, don't worry about the um, exact nature of, you know, did you get the spout just right or is the opening oval just right? Uh, you, know, the, you know, the spout, all of those things. Um, just start looking at those dark areas and try to override that part of your brain that wants you to put edges and lines where you don't see them. So that's what this exercise is going to be about. And then whether you're working with a pencil or with charcoal, Go ahead and blend or smooth those darks in. You know, perhaps then start adding a, a little bit of that other tonality that you're, see, you're seeing. Um, now, I don't have examples of this to show you of my own of my own drawing of this. Uh, I'm working on a larger still life um, to show you in in a complete video demonstration uh, for next week. But for this, I ju this is just about training your eye to see the darks. So don't don't worry about what's happening, whether you're getting it right or not. Now, while you're sketching, I am going to point out a number of, of things that are always useful to look at when you're uh, doing a still life like this. And one of those is understanding where the, the light is coming from. So the big clue, of course, on this is we've got a shiny object. There's a huge highlight. Obviously, the um, the light is coming from somewhere kind of kind of behind us and is shining directly on this object. So the cast shadow is the one that is being um, put onto the cloth by, uh, uh, you know, by the, I guess, what is this, a tankard? I think it's part of a tank. No, no, maybe it's part of a kettle. <laughs> by whatever this is without the lid. <laughs> onto the cloth. And then likewise, the shell is casting a shadow onto the um, this object. <laughs> I should have figured out what it was before I started talking today. But what's, what's useful is, for example, where that shell is casting that shadow, that particular arch tells you something about the, the uh, shell itself and also about the shape of the object that the shadow is being cast onto. So when you look at how other artists deal with shadows and, and shading and, and drawing and painting as well, it's interesting to see how they deal with this idea of cast shadows because often the shadow will help define the object behind the object that has the light on it so and that goes on when we have a more complex scene and a more complex still life as i'll be showing you next week that those cast shadows uh, make a huge difference um the other thing i'd like to point out is that the, and this is a, a technique um, point more than, than um, something to do with still life in, in particular. As you are shading and you are using, um, you're blending with your finger or a rag or a q-tip or a blending stump or whatever, you're picking up material, graphite or, or uh, charcoal on, on that, even on your finger, which you can then use to create those mid-tones. In other words, those silvery colors um, that, that we see on this, on this uh, teapot. Um, or some of the more subtle shading that's going on in the cloth behind. What you want to do is you want to keep your lights as light as possible. You want to keep those area, areas as clean as you possibly can. So when you do your shading, um, it's always best to start off a little on the light side. Don't go for the super darkest dark right away. Um, get those 
uh, get the get the darks in, then sort of work up some of the more subtle shading that's going around, uh, along, maybe by using some of this residue that's already on your rag or finger or whatever. Um, and then you go back and, and you restate the darks. You make them a little more accurate. Because once you've started adding in some of those other values that you see on the form, now you're starting to get a sense of shape. But you're also probably starting to see where things didn't go right the first time. Um, and, and so there's always an opportunity for some correction. Now, I find that if I do a lot of blending and if I use a blending stump and I'm really sort of grinding that charcoal into the paper, it is not easy to lift the charcoal off later, which is why I suggest sort of, uh, you know, being a little cautious in the, in the lighter areas and keeping those light areas picked out with your eraser, whether you're using a kneaded rubber eraser or whatever you're using, trying to keep those areas as light as you possibly can. Uh, until you need to add the shading. Because once you go to the darker areas, it is difficult to backtrack um, and, and move out of that, uh, out of those darker values that you've put in completely. And the other thing I'd like to point out is, is relative values. So what we've got here is a situation where we have lots of darks and we don't have that many lights. We have the silvery tones of the, of the kettle. I'm going to call it a kettle. <laughs> <laughs> or teapot, and um, um, we have the we have the dark shadows that are cast. We have the dark shadows of the of the teapot itself, and then we've got the fabric behind it, which um, is pretty dark. Not only are the folds dark, the the fabric itself is pretty dark. So, what some people do with 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 charcoal, and particularly if you're working with some of the the finer or looser charcoal, is to uh, to go ahead and just very lightly color that entire background piece of fabric in and smudge that, that in. Go ahead and blend all of that in to make sort of a tone that doesn't really have all of the shading and such in it necessarily, um, or works into the shading if you've already got to that point. And just have that be, you know, one or two values just sitting back there uh, in, their, in the drawing so that then you can judge the relative lightness or darkness of the, of the other objects against that. And um, this, is, this is really the, the focus of my demonstration for next week. We'll, we'll be talking about you know, playing these values back and forth and making sure that by the time you've finished your drawing, the values as they go from white to a little bit darker, a little bit darker in the mid-tones, then darker, darker, heading all the way to black. The, the full range is represented. It doesn't have to look photographic, but it does have to adhere to some of the principles of light and shade. Um, and lost edges are a really good way to sort of get rid of a lot of information. You've got a lot to deal with. There's a lot going on, even in something like this, it really is just two objects on a fabric background. Um, and so losing a bunch of edges and losing a bunch of stuff into the darks is sort of a bit of a relief in a sense. It's a way to get those things you know, out, of, out of mind, but they also help create that sense of design. So go ahead and wrap up, up this sketch that you're doing at the moment. And as you come into those last, uh, the last minute on the sketch, just go back and hit those darkest dark areas. Try to get those as accurate as possible, even if, even if there are problems elsewhere. Um, and, and have a look and see, you know, how did your darks to your lights, how did that work? Were you able to keep the lightest lights? Did your darkest darks get dark enough? Um, and that's why you use the no 10 to refer back to later and say, okay, you know, did I, did I smudge too? Did I blend too much? Did I end up with a bunch of midtones? And do I need to readdress that interesting design I saw to start with? Okay. We are now going to move on. And as I, always, I send the PDF around after class. So if you, uh, if you want to you know, spend more time drawing this, you certainly can. So a fun fact, and I have a little video here for you. Highlights and reflections move depending on your position relative to the light source and the object. Um, so although highlights are very useful to help you show form, you want to make sure you're not just arbitrarily applying them. Um, and I'm going to play this little video. So watch very carefully these along the rim of this, of this cup. Watch these highlights move as I move around the cup. Pretty cool, huh? So because of that, 
because of that, you do want to make sure that you are really observing where those highlights are and not just saying, hey, you know, there's always a rim, uh, a, a highlight rim around a, a coffee cup. There's always a, a highlight over here. You really want to observe what's happening in the particular scene you're looking at and make sure those highlights um, are appropriate. Whoops. Let's get on to the next slide. Okay, so drawing figures. We've got um, some time now to, to get into figures. And figures really, you know, I, I know you're probably going, oh my gosh, I could barely manage the shell and the, and the tea kettle, and now we're going to draw people. I don't think, know anything about drawing people. I only draw stick figures or whatever it happens to be. But what I would like you to do is start thinking of people as just being shapes, no different than the shell or the or the tea kettle or any of the other things that we have drawn and here to sort of illustrate that i've taken away all that information that usually gets in our way which is you know what does the head look like what do arms and, and feet and bodies look like and and i have uh selected this photograph for us just to talk about right now because if you squint at this what you see are light shapes and dark shapes only now our brain once again, knows that this is a person and starts filling in a bunch of other information about the suit, about what they're doing, about the back of the guy's head that we cannot actually see. So it's really important to, to, no matter what the subject is that we're talking about drawing, that we take the time to remember that everything we look at is just a form with light falling on it or a form that is somehow Part of it is hidden from the light and we're just trying to identify the shape um, of the of the object that we are um, looking at in order to draw it and we want to understand the values you know where is it the lightest where is it the darkest and where are those middle tones so squinting definitely helps as you as you well know so we're going to talk about the terminator and and i put here no not this one <laughs> um, because the terminator is actually a um the terminator of, of a shadow. Um, and we talk about the terminator line. Artists often mention the terminator line. And this is an area which can be either a soft gradation or it can be a very hard edge, as you can see it at the bottom, where the, the object is shaded from the light that is hitting it. For some reason, the light, and in this case, we have a single light source, the light cannot get around the edges of the object and therefore it creates this terminus, the terminal area of the shadow. Um, and finding, identifying where that is on objects is the key to drawing and painting people, objects, uh, whatever, and making them look realistic. Now, one thing that'll happen is if you look at a lot of uh, photography that's online, for example, nowadays, um, much of it is overlit. It's lit, for example, product photography, um, if you, you know, go to Amazon or whatever. It's lit to the point where there aren't shadows because they're trying to make everything look as beautiful as possible. But if you go out in real life and you take pictures of things, you'll start to see that the, the objects, um, and you will ha might have to squint, especially if they're color objects until you get used to this. Objects have defined areas of light and dark, and this separation helps you know, for example, if I look at this, I know I'm not looking at a circle, I know I'm looking at a sphere, because I see that gentle curve and I see the gentle smoothness. So when we're looking at a person and we're trying to figure out um, how we're going to draw that person and how we're going to do it in charcoal or pencil or, or any you know black and white, for example, um, sure, we, we need to, it's nice if we can draw the person relatively accurate in terms of their overall form. But what really makes that person look three-dimensional is discovering where that terminal line is. Where is that terminator that um, indicates the, the difference between the light and dark? And whether it's subtle or whether it's sharp tells us a little bit about the object. So on this guy's arm and on his legs, he's evidently reasonably skinny, and so that uh, and the light is very um, direct, and it has a and we have a dark background, so we see a very uh, defined line with a kind of a sharp terminator on his back, which is more lit because he's leaning out the window and it's broader because of that shape. It's a much more subtle. Uh, um, change over the back of his ribs as it gets to the underneath of his arm. So this is the sort of information that helps you start to think of people and think of figures as um, sort of, you know, complex still life 
rather than worrying about all of that brain information about eyes and nose and ears and this, that, and the other. You know, that's all important. But to start with these big shapes is, is really key. When I start painting, for example, the first thing I do is, sure, I'm putting some lines down that indicate where the guy would be sitting. But then the next thing I'm going to do is, is uh, mark in all, mass in all of those dark areas and being very careful of exactly where I'm putting that terminator line or that terminator area marking marking that change between light and dark because that's going to give all the correct information about that person so depending on the subject that you're trying to draw uh, each figure um, gives you different um, sort of challenges but also different information to use in your drawing so this guy in this particular case very difficult to find any uh terminator line because it's a softly lit day very foggy very misty the light is being dispersed in such a way that there isn't that high contrast so we have to look for different types of clues in this case the guy is well silhouetted so drawing you know the general outline of him as a form is not so um so uh difficult also there's a defined uh, angle to his arm. There, um, we, if, if we squint, we don't have, we don't get um, so distracted by all of the, the folds and puckers of his windbreaker. And we can also see that the, there's more light at the top of his head and the top of his hat and the, in, a, in his shoulders and the top of his arm. We can see that more clearly when we squint. And those are the starting places. We're doing a drawing like this of somebody. Now, these fellows, it's a little bit diff um, uh, different. In this particular case, you've got a lot of darks, and you, you need to get this sense of motion across. And so once again, people usually, if they're presented with a, an image like this, you know, they start either freaking out if they haven't done a lot of figure drawing, or they start trying to draw an accurate person in the scientific uh, way rather than going okay what is the form this person you know what's what's exactly going on here are there large dark areas i can key in on if i squint i can actually see quite a bit actually 50 percent of both of these guys is actually in the darks and start using those areas of the body to sort of create the entire sense of of what's going on so our brains are des designed to supply us with the rest of the information when we see something uh, that is completely dark. For example, you know, the guy's got his open jacket. We know there's a shirt in there. Our brain just knows that. Um, we also know on the other fellow, even though we can't differentiate the top of his arms, we know that, you know, he's not actually joined like that, like we see. But we have to override that information when we're actually doing the artwork. So this is what I'd like you to draw for uh, some of the time that we have remaining is this guy right here. Because I thought he, we're not going to get so distracted in what his face looks like and this, that, and the other. He might as well be, you know, a statue or a very oddly shaped vase. <laughs> but what I'd like you to do is just do a very quick no tan, just so that you spend a couple of minutes just really looking at the guy's outline. Um, do a few quick lines, uh, then go to, to um, another sketch where you do a few quick lines to put the objects and shapes in the right place. And then head right in there with those um, medium soft charcoals or, or the darker pencils you have to sketch in the dark areas, which is most of this guy, right? I mean, it really doesn't start getting light until you get up to his shoulders. And then once again, that same pattern repeats. Um, it's dark under his beard, and then you head up to the lighter values at the top of his head. Um, with the business of the water in the background, what I would do is as you get some, uh, either either you can do it with your pencil or charcoal pencil right away, just sort of get a, a middle tone in there and don't worry much about what's going on. Just make that one medium value that is lighter than most of the guy, but darker than the sky. And then you can just not worry about that for the moment. Um, and we've got about 10 minutes or so to work on this. So once again, I'm going to just uh, talk a little bit about um, just some other aspects to do with drawing and drawing figures while you're while you're sketching away. All right. So one of the things I'm going to talk about um, as we're as we're working on this, and um, because this guy is wearing clothing and a hat, which is uh, always useful, um, is, you know, when we talk, when we were looking at the saucer and we were imagining how it went around behind the cup 
even though we couldn't see it. The same thing happens with hats and with collars and sleeves and, and uh, cuffs and all of that sort of thing. Um, one, of the, one of the ways that artists tend to trip themselves up a little bit when they're starting to draw figures and, and draw clothing on the figures is get this idea um, of, of the hat continuing around the round form of the head on the other side. And so it, in this particular example, we don't see it so clearly um, because we're not close up. And, and um, I'm going to actually have a model sitting for us later in the summer who uh, will be wearing something that'll, that'll indicate this a little bit more. But what I'd like you to start doing is when you're chatting to people, your family members or friends or on Zoom, start looking at how the neckline of clothing goes around behind the neck. I mean, it continues around behind the neck in an, in an oval of a kind that shows you what the back of the neck must be shaped like. And those imaginary lines, that's that business of understanding. You know, we know, we know what a shirt looks like. We know what a neck looks like. Um, you know, we see that the shirt stops when it reaches the neck, or in this case with this guy, we see only the one half of the hood. We don't see any of the other information of the hood. Somehow, as we draw it, what's important, for example, on this guy's hood those lines on the right, as the hood uh, sort of folds together and comes down you know, towards the front, whatever that is, is to, towards the zipper or drawstrings or whatever it is, those folds there are important because they show to anyone looking at, at your drawing that this object doesn't just stop there. It, it sort of continues around the back. And that's very sort of subtle information to include. You can see also, in the folds on his arm, how that works, how there's sort of a circular shape to those folds um, as they get down, particularly near the cuff and the, um, the, you know, the fabric starts to crunch up a little bit. You see how those circular uh, uh, shapes continue even though we don't see them. So as you're looking at people, as you look at your arm and look at how the folds work, look at other people, particularly people who are wearing thicker clothing, it's easier to see if someone's got a sweatshirt on or something like that, um, to see how these folds continue around the body and to see how things like hats and collars and such are, and cuffs on sleeves, how there's an imaginary line that continues that you can't see, sort of a construction line that continues behind the body. This is really important to, to making things three-dimensional, whether you're drawing still life or whether you're drawing people. Oh, another thing that I would like to mention also, since we're getting near the end of the class, is I'm, I'm definitely very happy to see uh, anyone's artwork that wants uh, to share it with me. That's no problem. You're under no obligation. And you know, as I say all the time, you never have to show your work in, in, uh, during the, the course of the class. But in particular, I'm interested that if anyone is in, wants to do this at the end of the summer and send me some pictures of sort of the various different things you drew during the course of the summer, um, I'd be happy to give you some input. Um, I don't really critique because I don't like critiques. I think it's a horrible, I think critiques are horrible. Um, and I'm not sure that people get a lot of value out of them. But I do think it's important to, you know, recognize what is working in someone's work and sort of tell them where, where to go next, what, what the next thing to concentrate on is. So if you're doing these classes and, and you do all 20 of them, or even if you do a, a considerable number, um, and you feel like you've made some progress, but you want to know what to do next, you know, please do feel free to, to get in touch with me. Likewise, if you run into a problem as we go along, I can't always answer immediately. It might take me a few days, depending on what's going on. But I'm happy to, to uh, give you some input and, and provide you with a little direction. Um, it's so important because we have very few opportunities to learn drawing, and yet solid drawing uh, you know, sp in particular, if you if you like to do other types of art, such as painting, it makes all the difference. This kind of observation and this very immediate uh, media of of pencil or or charcoal or Conte crayon or whatever, um, you know, really is going to make a huge difference in how your artwork in general turns out. All right, we've got about three more minutes for this uh, for this drawing. 
just uh, give it, actually, let's just do two more minutes because I want to, I've got a few more things to say. So one other thing I'd like to talk about is, I know that, that a lot of you, um, this is probably your one opportunity during the week to, to actually do any drawing. And so we, we race through these various different exercises and you're not always having an opportunity to come back. But you know, you have, these videos exist and you have these PDFs and at any point you can come back and, and uh, you know, do this, go through this information again. And I highly recommend it. So I don't know if any of you work out or use weights, do any weightlifting. But if you do, you'll know that um, you start off lifting a certain you know, amount of weight, 15 or 20 pounds or whatever it is. And you know, say you have to do 10 repetitions. I'm going to do, lift this weight 10 times. After you've done that a while, it becomes easier, much, much easier. Um, and so once you finish doing a whole routine for a number of months, often people will start that same routine over again, but with heavier weights, because now you're sort of upping your game, you're getting to that next level. And so whether or not you're taking the time or able to take the time this summer to actually draw, um, I would strongly re recommend whenever you can, perhaps over the winter, to start through the entire process again and do everything again, because you will be so much better the second time through because you'll have absorbed all of that information. You'll have spent 20 weeks observing the world around you, trying different techniques. Um, and so when you come back to those initial classes, you'll be like this, you know, and, and it, it'll really reinforce that information for you. All right, time to wrap up and we'll move on to the, uh, to the last bit of info. All right, so as, as sort of homework, you can either go back and uh, draw one of those um, still lives or one of the other um, pictures we looked at. But if you're up for something a little more complex, Richard Wright, this fantastic photo of Richard Wright, has just about every value in it going from white to black. Um, and there's just some wonderful cast shadows. There are those completely lost edges underneath the book um, where he's sitting on the chair, um, you know, his... his uh, his clothing there's there's just so much here so this is this is a sketch that if you are feeling that you're up for trying something a little bit complex um see what you can do with this start with a no 10 even though this is a nice layout we already know it is just to give you time to look at how your shadow areas what kind of design your shadow areas are going to take so that you can get back to that when you start losing it on all of the middle values and if you don't want to work on that then you can work on the Terminator. <laughs> and I pulled this, uh, this image back in because this is, this is a really great image of, of Arnold Schwarzenegger in terms of, of showing you where the Terminator line is, where the Terminator of the shadow is. I mean, you can see that really clearly. He's lit from two different directions. He's got a, a blue light coming from one direction and you know, a pale light from the other. But this is a really great exercise. Lots of lost edges, Terminator line, all of that sort of thing. So just to wrap up, uh, charcoal, um, still life and figures is sort of the introduction here. It doesn't really matter what the subject is or the drawing medium. We can use line and shading to su suggest form, detail, dark and light. And how you go about that is as much a matter of trial and error as anything else. You'll come up with some techniques that you like and want to repeat again and others which you find are uncomfortable or, or whatever it happens to be. And I'd like it very much if, as you go about uh, your life this week to Pay attention to how um, every, every area of every uh, surface has a lighter and a darker quanti uh, quality to it. And if you're not sure, if you can't really see it, sometimes if you sort of make a little eye hole with your hand and look at an object and then look at the other end of the object, it'll be more obvious to you to see that light and dark, um, ch that, uh, that change. And that's something as artists that we can use to enhance whatever it is we're drawing on. Look for those lost edges all over the place. If you, if you can't, generally, if you can't see it, you don't want to draw it. Um, it'll help give you a more realistic idea of, of light and dark. And likewise, wherever that Terminator shadow fa um, falls, and whether it's soft or sh um, sharp, also uh, is a great way to indicate um, what the object is that you're drawing. Likewise, cast shadows that are falling on things. So once again, we're, we're trying to draw what we see with an understanding of what we know. It's really important to, to sort of pull the both together and train your brain to do something other than just data collection and regurgitation. It'll, it'll make all the difference in your artwork. 
And like I said, generally we say, if you don't see it, don't draw it. But you might intentionally be trying to add something in. You might find, like I did in my sketch of, of that uh, organic hens and chickens thing I showed you early on, I needed a few lines in there. It just wasn't enough not to have any. So, you know, put in whatever it is that you need to have um, to make your artwork uh, work for you. Okay, so what we're going to do is next week, I've got a much more detailed um, uh, scene that I've done a demonstration on. And you'll be able to draw along with me as we go step by step through it. Um, because I do want to show you how more shapes and forms in space work. And likewise, with a person, what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate on a head that has a lot of light and dark, a lot of high contrast to it. Um, you won't have to worry about whether you know anatomy or anything of the sort. I'm going to light it in such a way that the, the shadow areas and, and finding the terminus, uh, the terminal areas of, the, of the, um, the shadow will help create that sense of form. And you'll be able to use uh, charcoal to do that. So thank you so much for letting me rush you through all that information today. I know that was a ton. Um, and you're just going to, you know, you just dove in and, and tried it with whatever materials you have. So we'll get a little bit more granular, as they say, next week, uh, talking about figures and still life and particularly as it pertains to charcoal.